Welcome to Jenny's Kitchen. As we all know, Valentine's Day has been a tradition to celebrate our sweethearts. And on today's show, I'm gonna show you how to make a wonderful dinner to celebrate your sweetheart or anyone else you'd like to show appreciation to. On today's show, we're gonna be doing a beautiful stuffed filet mignon and puff pastry with other goodies and roasted potatoes that are really called fingerlings with fresh herbs, a wonderful simple salad with a simple vinaigrette and port wine brownies. So with that said, I'd like to get started and take you back to the stove and show you how we're gonna melt our chocolate, our port wine, and our um, butter. Now let me give you a caution about melting chocolate. It's best to use a double boiler, and if you don't have a double boiler, then set a nice stainless steel bowl over a pot of simmering water. And if you can, make sure that the bottom does not touch it because what you wanna do is you want your chocolate to melt slow and be cool when you're finished. Now, I'm using a copper pot because copper melts chocolate a lot faster than a double boiler would. But I'm gonna caution you, I have ruined many a batch of beautiful hand-cut chocolate because I put it on the stove, went to do something else and came back and it burnt. So stay with it all the time. So we're gonna start here with a couple of cubes of butter. And I like to put the butter in the bottom of my pan first because I want my chocolate to go right on top of that. I'm going to turn on a very low flame here. And you'll be amazed at how quickly this chocolate will melt. We're just going to put all this beautiful chocolate. If you want to use chocolate chips, you could, but it really is best to use a nice Belgian grade of chocolate. And I'm sure any market would have what you need. And we're just gonna pour this right in it. And there is a special spoon for melting chocolate and it's a wooden spoon and it has a little hole right in the center so as you're stirring the chocolate, it stirs all the way through. All right, the butter's already starting to melt as is the chocolate. And the reason why is because I have my ovens on and these were set on top of the stove and so they melted a little but ordinarily you wouldn't have that and then now you're just going to intermarry your chocolate and your butter until it's all melted and it's not going to take very much time at all now if you want to use white chocolate you can also use white chocolate but dark chocolate with port wine is really the best and as you can see We've only been at the stove a couple of minutes and it's already turning to liquid. So again, use a pot like copper on a low flame or a double boiler, stay with it. Do not leave it for anything. And you can see how it's already melting. This is a great dessert. Now, if you wanna use a brownie mix, you could um, and just add the port wine for the liquid, but I really prefer to start from scratch. And this is such a simple recipe, I doubt very much that you're gonna wanna use a mix. Okay, a couple more stirs. Okay, now we're gonna add our port. Today I'm using a Millier Cox Spring Sierra Foothill Zinfandel port to add to the brownies. And we're going to add about, oh, a half a cup. Okay. 
And we're just going to incorporate that into the mix here because the chocolate is melted. I just want to make sure all that wine, that beautiful, delicious port gets into that. Mm -mm -mm. I love chocolate. And if you love chocolate, you're going to love this dessert. Okay, everything's melted, as you can see here. So we're ready now to add our other ingredients. Once your ingredients have been melted, then you're going to come and you're going to incorporate the next three ingredients. And we're going to start with a four eggs. And I'm going to show you a little secret in the event that you get an eggshell into your eggs. I know I've tried paper towel spoons. Nothing works. But I'm going to deliberately, on this next egg, put a piece of shell in there and show you how to retrieve it. Okay, let me just break off a piece here like this. We're going to put it in. You're just going to take a piece of your egg, and you're just going to scoop it up, and here it is. Because it's so used to being inside the egg, this is familiar, and it'll just, boom, come right to where you need it. All right, so then we're going to beat these whole eggs just until they're, they look a little creamy. Okay, come on now. Okay, I'm going to lock it. I'm going to put it on low. If you put it on a higher speed, it's going to splash all over. So when you first start something, do it low, and then as it breaks down, you can always increase your speed. And all the yolks now have been incorporated into the whites. Now we're going to add our sugar. And we're going to gradually add our sugar. And again, we're going to start on a low speed, add some sugar, and then we're going to raise our speed. Once all the sugar has been added to the eggs, get that last drop, we're going to increase our speed. And now we're going to gradually fold in our flour. So six ingredients to make great scratch brownies. Butter, chocolate pieces, Port wine, eggs, flour, and sugar. It can't be much simpler than that. What's happening now is that the flour is incorporating into the egg and sugar mixture, and it's not as loose as the eggs were, so now we can increase the speed a little bit. That's it, folks. Now I'm going to go back and I'm going to get the uh, chocolate and I'm going to bring it over and incorporate that in this. What you don't want to do is you don't want to have your chocolate be hot because if you do it's going to cook your eggs. So once you take it off your burner, let it sit for about 10 minutes. And now we're just going to add this in. Mm -mm -mm. I wish you could smell the aroma of this wonderful port wine and chocolate. Yes, siree. Get as much of it as you can out of your pan. And who gets to lick the spoon in your house? I know in my house it would be moi. Okay. We're going to bring these up. I've lined these heart-shaped pans with foil, and I'll explain why as soon as I get the mixer going. Again, you want to start off on a low speed to incorporate the chocolate into your uh, egg, flour, and sugar mixture. Now, these are heart-shaped pans, and I've just put some foil in like this, and I'm just going to butter the tops a little bit. And you butter a little bit on the bottom, and that makes the foil stick. That way it doesn't slip around.
Okay, now this should be ready. If you like walnuts, by all means, add some walnuts, add some cashews, dried fruit, whatever you want. But I just like good old plain brownies. Okay, now, mm boy, look at that. We're going to pull this off. Got to get every last drop. Sometimes chocolate could be a little messy, but you know what? You just roll with it. Okay, now we're going to take this off. Now, when you're doing your foil, as you've noticed, I've left about an inch or two on each side because after they're cool, then you just pull this out, and when you invert it, you just pull the foil. It comes right off because if you put it directly without a little lip, then you'd have a heck of a time getting it out of the pan. So let's line these up. Do one stir. Mmm, boy. Yummy, yummy in the tummy. This is wonderful. I found this odd-shaped uh, spatula, and I absolutely love it because you can really, as you can see, it really cleans the bowl. Let me hold the bowl better for you. But you can see it does a real good job on just cleaning out the whole bowl. All right, I'm going to pop this in the oven at 375. We're going to cook it for about 15 to 20 minutes, test it. And if it's not cooked all the way, check it in five-minute intervals. And now I'm happy to say we have a special guest on today's show, our wonderful, knowledgeable, wise butcher, C.J. Gott. And he's going to show you and talk to you about preparing filet mignons. Now before CJ comes on, I want to set our timer so our brownies don't burn. So if you hear a little ticking and then eventually a bell, you'll know why. All right, we're going to set this for, if you hear that noise, it's only the brownies. Okay, let me go like this and bring it back to about this amount of time. All right, here he is, folks, the guy we've all been waiting for, the one and only C.J. Gott, the Angels Camp famous butcher. C.J., good morning. Hi, Jenny. Thank you for coming oh, on my no show. Problem. I always appreciate you. You always leave our viewers with such a wealth of wisdom. So we're doing filet mignon today, so C.J. is going to show you what a real whole filet mignon looks like and talk a little bit about it. Okay, this is the tenderloin. Um, they do come a little bigger. They come out here, but we like the hearty part. We don't the the smaller sides harder to use on fillets. You'd end up with small little Deep bite things. size. Yeah, so we get the uh, just the hearty side, and it comes with a lot of gristle tendon on top there. Okay, that people don't like that with their fillets. No. It's a tender piece. It's kind of pricey, so you don't want that on there. Right. I think I paid about $20 a pound for the fillet. Now, why, why are uh, fillets so pricey? Um, well, they there's not too much on a beef, on a steer, so... And it's the most tender part, so people want that. The tenderness, the flavor, doesn't have a lot of fat. So no, a lot of people tend to go to this or ribeye, depending on what your preference of beef is. So it's supply and demand. The it more is. people want it, the higher the price goes. Definitely. I get it. Definitely. So I'm going to clean this up a little bit, just show the viewers on why and what we do. Take care of this piece of meat because it's so, so expensive. He makes it look so easy. You, every time you're on, you just amaze me with your knife cutting skills. It's like you could probably do it in your sleep. I probably do do it in my <laughs> sleep. I know it's as busy as you all are at Angel's Market, but you give a quality, quality product, and that's why I shop there so much. See, there's some good tendon right there. Yeah. That would You could chew on that for a while. So we're just going to take that off. And there's a big hunk of fat that sits down in there. So viewers, if you wanted to do a whole filet, if you just watch what CJ has just done, you could do it and then feed the scraps to your dog or- Oh yeah, yeah. cook it down. Yeah, cook it, cook it down. Yeah, do whatever you want to with it. 
Now, sometimes I like to take a whole filet and butterfly it and stuff it with herbs and garlic and Dijon mustard and, and tie it and roast it. But, oh, my gosh, that looks beautiful, CJ. Now, yeah, this nice this one. white part is called a sinew, and that can yes, be tough, right? it can. Right. It can very well be tough. The thicker, the tougher. Well, that doesn't look too thick at all. No, but it comes off really so easy. So easy, yeah. Get a little bit on that bottom side. I notice when I cook with lamb, sometimes if I get the leg, there's some sinew on it. There so is. It just holds that muscle to whatever it's attached to. So this is actually yeah. sitting on the side of the loin. Got it. Which is the New York. And this is how you get your porterhouses, your T-bones with a little filet on the side. Oh, very good. It's a nice chunk in there that we like to take out. And then it's really just getting this top piece. So it's not difficult. And it's not really time consuming because it's not like you're, you know, cutting There's everything not a lot off. On no, this there piece. there really, really isn't. But I tell you what you better have is a sharp knife. <laughs> because if you don't every time I go in there the butchers are sharpening their knives and you know. And two, dull knives cause accidents, right? Very, yes. Yeah. That's how people get their fingers cut. Yikes. Oh, that is gorgeous. Look at how pretty that is. Again, you've made it look so simple, CJ. It's not too difficult. Well, you just have to know what area to, to cut. Yeah. And now, viewers, you know what area to cut as well. Look at that gorgeous piece of meat. Sometimes you can wrap pancetta, which is an Italian bacon or regular bacon, around your filet if you're going to cook it because, as you can see, there's hardly any fat on the filet at all. Hardly any. Yeah, so you were talking about tying it or yes. stuffing it as a roast. Right. You know, this is pretty much how it comes. Okay. I like to roll it over. Let me use some of your string here. Of course. And I, I always start in the middle. Okay, and do this slow for myself and oh, the viewers. Okay, because okay. okay, if we're going to lose, we're going to learn it the right way. Okay. Just a twist with the fingers, and then you reach through and grab it. Wow. I'll show you a few more times. Please do. The reason why I start in the middle is to get an even, oh, even time, good. so okay. then I go to an end. All right. And again, I just grab it with two fingers, twist, twist it around, pull it through. Now, what kind of a knot is that, CJ? We call this the butcher's knot. Oh, just the butcher's knot. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know. I've heard square knots and round knots, and I didn't know, you know, if they're... Okay, the butcher's knot. Very good. Okay. Got that. And then that would hold all your ingredients inside and... Yeah, if you lay rosemary or thyme on oh, the outside. Oh, yeah. Very good. And it presents nicer as a tied roast. It does. That's beautiful. We go down to the little end here. Now, if someone wanted to get a whole fillet and cut it into portions, how many ounces would they cut each fillet into? Um, typical, because it is a rich piece of meat, we go a little like six ounces. Got it. Um, but the meat lovers, they like their eight to twelve ounce steaks. Wow. Yeah. Okay. It's a lot. So it's just an individual taste, viewers. It's you know. Because I was thinking if I was having a dinner party, if I got a whole one, and if I had like a two pound, and if I divided that by six ounces, then I, every so many uh, inches I could tie it off, and then yeah. I'd have my, my actual six ounce steaks. I wouldn't have to guess. Right. Exactly. That's how we do it. We take the weight and determine how many steaks we can get out of each piece. Right. That's beautiful, CJ. Oh my gosh. Look at how gorgeous. Oh my gosh, that is so beautiful. Yeah, it's... What do you think, viewers? Your mouth watering already? <laughs> I know mine is. Well, that was very easy and very simple to do. So I thank you very much for coming on to show oh, our viewers anytime, how to do Jimmy. a great uh, piece of beef tenderloin. And is there anything else you want them to know about the tenderloin, CJ? Um, if you haven't had it, you should probably go try one out. <laughs> Amen to that. Yes. <laughs> I agree. And then I think I'll just cook that up for my daughter's dogs. What oh. do you think? Oh, yeah, they'd love it. You bet they would. Okay, viewers, when you come back, we're going to show you how to make the 
Beef Wellington's a la Jenny style. The timer went off. I want to take the brownies out of the oven. We don't want them to burn. Oh, yum. Yum, yum. Look at this. Mmm, I wish you were in my kitchen to catch this aroma. Delicious. We're going to set them over here. Here's the other one. Yum. Now, ideally, if you can let them cool off and put them in the refrigerator overnight, they are so dense and so chocolatey that you feel like you're eating fudge. They're delicious. Okay, on to our filet mignons. Now, puff pastry comes two ways. It comes in a sheet, which is a long rectangle, or it comes in little shells. So if I'm doing a round, uh, like a filet mignon, I'm going to get the little shells. But the choice is yours. And we're just going to roll them out. Now, I like to use marble because you don't need to use any flour or a minimal amount of flour for your dish because your dough won't stick to the marble like it would to an, another type of cutting board. So now that we've taken this, I like this cheese, it's borson. I put it in my mashed potatoes, um, I eat it on crackers, I use it for my uh, beef wellington, it's really good. So we're going to spread a little bit on the dough and then we're going to place a mushroom. This is a baby portabella. And we're going to place that down. And then we're going to take a filet mignon. And we're going to lay that down. And then we're going to wrap all of this over the top. And we're going to seal it up. And then it's going to be presented like this. Now, if you're going to serve this on Valentine's Day, I suggest you take one of these puff pastry hearts that I previously cut. And we're just going to moisten the back. That's why I wet my hands. And we're going to place it right on the piece of puff pastry. And as it browns to a beautiful golden, the heart will um, puff up as well. So now we're going to take, here's some that I cut from the sheet so you can see the difference. And sometimes people love blue cheese, so on these we're going to crumble up some blue cheese. And we're going to lay a mushroom down. And we're going to pick up a filet. And we're going to again cover it. Make sure that you have all the little ends covered and exposed so nothing is exposed, pardon me. Pinch it under, squeeze it, do whatever you have to do to ensure it. It looks like this. I'm going to wet my hands again, take another heart, and there we go. So we have a blue cheese and a Borson cheese, Beef Wellington Jenny style. Now I want to tell you this. When you get a mushroom, mushrooms have a tendency to be very watery. So I never wash my mushrooms like I do my other vegetables, you know, where you scrub them or put them under water. I simply wet a paper towel and I wipe all around and look at what comes off. So, and then this little stem here, take it and twist it around. It leaves a hole like this. Wipe out the inside. And that's all you do. Now, I, for these mushrooms, I cleaned them like I just showed you. I melted a little butter and garlic in the pan. And then I put them cap down. This is the cap first. And seasoned them and just waited till they shrunk a little bit. I didn't want to cook them all the way because they are going to go into the oven and cook some more. And then flipped them over and then let them cool. And um, now we're going to put these 
beef wellingtons into the oven at about 425 degrees for about 20 minutes. Now, as you can see, these are not raw because you have to sear them first. You, you want to get a little, a little brown color on your meat. So I seared them, hot flame, melted butter, bubble, butter was bubbling, plop them in, cook them at the most, a minute per side, pull them out, let them cool. Because you still want the insides to be raw because again, it's going to cook in the oven and I don't like overdone meat. So with that said, I'm gonna pop these into the oven and then we're going to move on to making some wonderful roasted potatoes with fresh herbs. I remember when everyone used to steam their vegetables and steamed vegetables are good, but if you'd never roasted a broccoli or a carrot, you don't know what you're missing. Roasting just intensifies the flavor. I just cannot describe to you how great roasting a vegetable is. Now there's a lot of things you could prepare with the filet mignon. You could do mashed potatoes, you could do baked potatoes, twice baked potatoes, you could do scalloped potatoes, au gratin potatoes, but I'm gonna show you how to make a simple roast potato that will knock your socks off. Okay, these little potatoes here are called fingerlings and you can see why just by their shape and they don't come out year round so when they're in season I try to buy them as much as I can to prepare them the ways that I like them so here we have a bowl of fingerlings and I'm going to sprinkle a little olive oil on the fingerlings now and good old olive oil and then here's some fresh thyme we're going to sprinkle on a little fresh thyme Gotta have a lot of time. And a little salt. And then we're just gonna mix them up in a bowl. And the salt is so good because the skins just, they just sizzle and burst and oh, they're out of this world. And then in a single layer, you never wanna roast a vegetable in a double or triple layer. You want it to cook on its own by itself. So you just spread this out. I love using parchment paper because I just wrap it up at the end of my roasting time and that's all I have to do to it. Now I want to show you, we're going to pop these into the oven about 375 degrees. These should be cooked in about 20 minutes. So let's go ahead right now. I'm going to pop them in the oven along with the fillets and we're going to um, have them roast together. This is a great one oven meal where you can put everything into the oven and you're set. Okay, I have the timer set again and uh, I wanna show you how to de-stem fresh thyme. So here's the thyme. Pinch it at the top, pull it down, and all your little pieces of thyme come out. And then I just pull the tops. So again, let's do this. Grab it at the top with your thumb and your index finger. Pull it down, takes it right off, and pull the top. And there you have all your little pieces of thyme. Very easy. It's the best way to use fresh herbs is to destem them. And now, on our return, I'm going to show you how to make a great simple salad with a very simple vinaigrette. Now, a meal would not be complete without some type of green, whether it be a vegetable that's cooked or raw or a salad. And I prefer salads because I love the crispness and I love to try different types of salad dressings. So first, I'm going to show you how to de-rib the leaf lettuce. Now, when it looks like this, and it has a snail hole in it and is kind of torn, toss it because you don't want to eat that. Even this one here doesn't look as good. I'll toss that too. This one looks fine. So I'm going to fold the ends in. I'm going to fold it together like this and then I'm just going to cut all this apart and I'm going to place it into my salad spinner. And I will continue with that. Nah, this one doesn't look too good. Now this side here doesn't look bad, so maybe I might trim a little off that side. But you want to get nice, beautiful looking leaves for your salad.
Here's another one that looks beautiful. Fold them in half lengthwise. Take them off the rib. And then you're going to spin it with some good cold, cold water. And when you bite into your salad, you get a nice little crunch from the inner leaves, but you don't have those crunchy pieces, those ribs that don't taste good at all. So when they get to about here like this, I break it off about here. And then I'll take the inner pieces like that. And here's one that we can do this with. And then we're just going to spin it. I have one of the salad spinners where the holes are in the bottom, so I spin it over the sink and all the water just comes out. It has a little hole on top here. Make sure the water's nice and cold. We're just going to let it go through and spin it. Shut the water off and spin it again. A little noisy, but what the heck. And when it stops spinning, here you have a nice container, beautiful, clean, good quality lettuce to eat. Now, for a vinaigrette. I like to make a simple vinaigrette from time to time. I love balsamic, I love lemon, I love red wine vinegar, I love rice wine vinegar. What you want to make sure is that your acid is half of what your oil is. So if I'm using a vinegar or lemon juice base, I might use a half a cup of the acid to a full cup of the olive oil. So with that said, we're going to make a very simple Parmesan vinaigrette. We're gonna throw in a couple of toes of clean garlic. We're gonna throw in some washed parsley that I destemmed. One thing about parsley, if you don't remove the stems, they incorporate just fine and they are flavorful. Some of the stems you don't want to use because they're hard like a tree stem. Okay, let's process this. That looks pretty good. You can see the little pieces of garlic that have been chopped up. Now we're going to add a half a cup of red wine vinegar. Sometimes if you have red wine, I purposely set it aside and wait till it turns to vinegar. I just put it under the uh, sink or out in the garage and come back, you know, several months later, a year later, and I have a nice vinegar. You can do that too. Okay. Looks good. Now the secret to a nice thick dressing is to let your oil emulsify with your other ingredients. So that means we're going to put it through this tube here. There's a tiny hole in the end and it's going to drip down, drip by drip, and that'll make our dressing nice and thick. Okay, that's all there was to that. Now we're going to sprinkle in a little salt. Oh, there we go. And a little cracked pepper. I hesitate to do that sometimes because it drips all over the countertop. And some Parmesan cheese. The fine, the fine grade is better. The finer grade is better. We're going to just whisk it a couple times. Fillets are ready.
that's it. All right, I'm going to go check the fillets, and we're going to come back and have our presentation. It for your sweetheart or anyone else, like I said in the beginning, you want to show appreciation to. And since, CJ, you're one of my many sweethearts, I want to invite you to stay for lunch. Can you do that? Oh, of course. Absolutely. Well, here we have our Beef Wellington's Jenny style. Normally, Beef Wellington is made like we made them, but it's made with no mushrooms and no cheese. It's made with a liver pate. But I don't know too many people that like pate anymore, so I created this myself using blue cheese and mushrooms or boysen cheese and mushrooms. Create your own essence. Like I've always told you, experiment. Do what you want to have. Do what your taste dictate. Here's our herb roasted potatoes, our fingerlings, our salad with our Parmesan vinaigrette, and our wonderful chocolate fudge port wine brownie. Now, I apologize it's in the pan, but it didn't cool long enough. So if I bring it out, it's going to disintegrate and fall apart, and I don't want that to happen. So with that said, I wish you all a very happy Valentine's Day and a happy any other day, and we'll see you on the next Jenny's Kitchen. Thank you, CJ, so much. You're welcome, I really Jenny. appreciate you all your help. Me. You bet. Bye, everyone.